Welcome, Jason, to the Haight-Ashbury Video Oral History Project. I also know you are AKA John Wesley Orr. Yes. Or your grandfather. Yes. And we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more. You're also, your friends call you the Birdman. Yeah, I'm Birdman. Exactly. <laughs> um, can I call you Jason? Yeah. Okay. Jason, let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Macon, Georgia, uh, dead center of Georgia. What year? 1947, February 19, 1947. And uh, your parents' names? My mother's name is Carrie Teresa Orr. Um, my father, um, I don't know if I want to give his name. My no. father was a well-known and national uh, uh, figure in the Beautiful. church. In the church, and I read it. Just... Yeah, that's fine. It's totally great. <coughs> All right, well, from your early begin beginnings in Georgia, I, I remember you saying you had a great love for trains. Yeah, I had uh, a love for trains. Uh, my grandfather, among <coughs> others, whomever I could cajole, uh, would uh, take me to the train station just to watch him come in and release his steam and all that stuff. Not necessarily take a ride, but whenever possible, uh, they would book me on a train, and, and by five years old, I was taking trips of my own on trains to various wow. cities. Wow. Yeah. By yourself? Yeah, and I got to know conductors. That's how, you know, I was taken wow. care of. My mom would walk me to the train, and two individual conductors, she knew them, and I felt like a really special wow. guy. It was like you meant to travel. It was yeah, right there in your youth. Yeah. So you were really good, or some you got a reward, and you got to ride on a train. Yeah, get always, out west. Yeah, I always. Yeah, I, I always got uh, uh, rewards uh, because I was good. I was a good student. I was uh, even an early uh, performer. Uh, before I ever came to California, I shut down uh, uh, elementary school, um, like assembly, you know, and everybody performs. I did Elvis Presley. I went out, I took my mom shopping, I bought myself a cream colored sport coat, uh, a black shirt, a pink tie, and um, black pants and shoes. Wow. Yeah, and, and I sang uh, uh, holding a guitar, and, uh, and my teacher uh, uh, picked out chords on the piano. I did Don't Be Cool. Wow. <laughs> about, about how old it were shut them down. I'm serious. About how, what, how old were you? Uh, I must have been like six years. Amazing. Wish we had a picture of that. That's amazing. So you had some early, uh, where do you think you got your music acting uh, uh, inspiration? Did it come from school or friends? M music uh, is actually kind of like the vehicle that's carried me through my life. I'm sure. in a single vehicle. Sure. That thread was strung first uh, in the home I was mostly raised in. In, uh -huh. in Macon, Georgia. I was raised uh, with the family for whom my mom was employed. Uh -huh. My mom was nanny oh, uh, to my brothers and sisters to me. Uh -huh. uh, John, Joseph, I'm going to call them Joe, John, Joe, and Helen. And to me, these were my brothers and sisters. Sure. So in actuality, in uh, 1952, they were millionaire uh, uh, white family and I was a little black boy, but I right. didn't know that yet. You didn't know that yet. That's <laughs> the way it should be. Yeah, know? and that's got something to do with, uh, uh, you know, my, my overall develop, uh, development, uh, sure. things later in life. Of course. Uh, yeah. You came out to California mm -hmm. on a train. Secretly, I found out uh, when I was old enough to understand and know, seems to me maybe about three years later when I was around just approaching my teens. My mom explained to me that our coming to San Francisco was not just uh, uh, simply a reward for me, but it was uh, part of um, my grandfather's concern for uh, the safety of both myself and my mother. Oh, wow. Given that the civil rights movement uh, was just beginning its early days uh, sure. kicking, right? In the South and, and people were continuing to be uh, uh, hung and, and brutalized, and, and my grandfather was afraid, so he talked to my mother about bringing me uh, wow. to San Francisco. Wow. Got to thank him <laughs> for bringing you here. So you guys came on a train, ended up in Oakland, 
No, it, well, the, <coughs> the train trip terminated in Oakland, and then we continued across the bridge. So <coughs> we waited about 15, 20 minutes, and then an aunt came and uh, drove us to San Francisco, and we uh, resided in uh, uh, Bayview Hunters Point wow. on Shafter Avenue. And where you shop. said you lived on H Street, 1200 block? Or yeah, later? I, probably about a year and a half later, my mom and I were living in the 1200 block of, of, of Page Street here. And uh, later on, I lived just a couple of blocks up the street myself, the first place I ever rented, uh, 1550 Page Street. What, uh, what year was this? that you moved to 1550 Page? I moved into 1550 Page Street late. Uh, 1964. I know that because I met uh, the friends, the, the people who were eventually going to be uh, my housemates, roommates, and best friends ever. You had uh, a picture of that house at 1550 Page? Yeah, We'd love to see it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite houses I've lived in here in the city. This is that picture. Beautiful. It's an amazing Victorian with all kinds of turrets and... Yeah. and uh, Balconies. I this think balcony, in the sixties. This balcony was our bedroom. Burby and myself, Roberta, Roberta Brown, and uh, it also had gargoyles on it. Yeah, and up in the witch's turret, which is what we called it way back then, uh, our friend Jim Pike lived in uh, that turret because one double mattress exactly fit Get inside in it. it in <laughs> and Amazing. up here behind the window are my uh, friends uh, Greg Copeland, who's uh, one of the most marvelous poets I know. Um, and even then, uh, uh, we couldn't believe we knew a guy who could write like that. Greg, his girlfriend, Judy, and there was uh, one cat in the whole house named Mr. Stuffy. Ah. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, that's a great house. Wonderful. And um, was you, you were one of the performers with the Mime Troupe. Uh, yeah. How did that start? How did you get involved? Uh, who did you meet? How? What? Tell us the beginning um, of the story. I was one again. There was music, and I and I, you know, didn't really get an early connection to music. A lot of classical music first, and then I had to be taught to accept other forms of music. But once um, I left high school, the most immediate thing I did. Um, uh, was to get off, uh, I believe it was uh, M. Ocean View st uh, streetcar coming from uh, San Francisco State University uh, uh, on uh, Saturdays. I was a part of um, uh, a program for musically gifted children uh, out at State College, held at State College. And we were coming back from that. We used to always sing on the streetcar, and people always try to book that particular car because you had <laughs> this gorgeous choral music. Anyway, so uh, we get down to Market Street, and there's a big hoop to do and a lot of turmoil and stuff right in front of the Sheraton Palace Hotel. And I was due to get off there anyway because you get off at that stop and you walk over and catch the 15th uh, Kearney and go back out to Hunters Point. Except this particular day, the streets were blocked because there was a huge demonstration at the Sheraton Palace Hotel because the Sheraton Palace Hotel at that time didn't have any employees of color at all, and specifically no black employees. A guy I knew who was later to become my closest and longest lived friend, the one or two, uh, Willie B. Hart, was walking and leading in song this demonstration circling in front of the front doors of the Sheridan Palace. And as I stepped down off the, the streetcar, I'm like a 16-year-old kid, maybe only 15 or so, but at least uh, 16. And I, I stepped down off the car, Willie B. Hart, who's a couple of years older than me and, and was at City College at the time, he said, hey, man, because he couldn't remember my name, he remembered my voice. He said, hey, man, come on over here and sing with us. You can sing. Come on over here and sing. And uh, eventually I'm telling him, but Willie, I don't know any of these songs. You know, like if you tell me uh, Bach chorales or, you know what, we used to do uh, uh, Ray Vaughn Williams or something. Right. Like, I don't know these songs. And he was saying, they're easy to learn. You know, I'll teach you. Just walk with me. So I started my first picket line. And wow. getting that cyclical, crazy, the madness, the energy. 
the passion of uh, all these people convinced that there's something immoral right. and unethical going down. And sure. you just put yourself on the line. That first night, 16 years old, um, I wound up laying on very plush carpet uh, inside the Sheraton Palace uh, lobby along with about 400 other people. Wow. And we were arrested. And we continued to demonstrate there for several weeks until they finally came to contract. And then next we moved to Auto Row, which is where I met Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> and uh, at Auto Row, eventually uh, came a friend, uh, uh, um, Roy Bauer, who told uh, myself and Willie B, hey, Jason, Willie B, there's this ad in the paper. They're looking for actors, okay? Uh, it's a church over on Cap Street. We're going to go over and audition. You know, and Willie B and I, you know, we know how this stuff is done because, like, uh, you know, uh, we are true revolutionaries. You use whatever you got. And uh, so, like, this thing says you need three black actors. Must be able to sing, dance, and have some political conscience. Roy Ballas says, Jake, you... For sure, you're in. <laughs> okay, he wasn't so sure about his own dancing ability. So anyway, that ad was uh, run by Ronnie Davis, uh, founder of San Francisco Nine Troops. We went over to this uh, church on uh, Cap Street, I think from maybe 1816, 16th and Cap, as I recall, and auditioned. And we auditioned by singing uh, civil rights songs, uh -huh. among others, and, and, and uh, Negro spirit spirituals and some doo-wop, and we were hired on the spot. That time on, uh, Willie B and I uh, performed and toured in that particular performance we were hired, hired for, which was uh, uh, Civil Rights in a, in a Cracker Barrel, uh -huh. or, yeah, or the Minstrel what Show. What year about was this, you know? Uh, we started working on that show um, in 65. We worked on it about eight or nine months, uh, developing, writing, uh, everything. It, it had no, uh, there was no script. Uh, like uh, a poem I hope to remember to do later, everything resided within the actors themselves, who themselves were the creators of this show. Right. So there was, one, no need for a script, and two, uh, on a given night, which is the way uh, guerrilla performers perform, uh, an actor may have different dialogue, sure. a different feeling sure. about something. So, Where were some of the places you performed? The Minstrel Show was notorious, right out the door. Where were some of the places we performed? Let me give you a, a, a longer list. Where were the places where eventually we were forbidden from performing? Including, at one point, Stanford University, uh, any and all campuses of the uh, uh, UC, University of California system. Uh, Governor Pat Brown made that particular decree that based upon his having seen the show himself for 15 or 20 minutes, whatever he could uh, tolerate, uh, that this show would not be seen on any uh, University of California campus. But once we began to tour our... Uh, um, Actually, leaving San Francisco, our first performances were at the Gate Theater in Sausalito. We were presented there by our friend and business manager of the San Francisco Mime Troop, Bill Graham. That was, to my recollection, that particular performance, the first time any poster ever said, Bill Graham presents. There was an earlier production of the Mime Troops, Candle Owl, in which it said, Bill Graham production, produces from Il Candelao. Uh, uh, but uh, the Minstrel Show poster uh, with my good friend John Broderick, uh, their mm -hmm. makeup on that poster, says at the top of the corner, Bill Graham presents. That was at the Gate Theater. We were immediately a smash. Everywhere we went, there was publicity preceding us. So that by the time we got to the succeeding city, uh, uh, Everybody was waiting for us, and, and, and the show was on. We toured uh, once we started leaving California. Uh, oh, first of all, we did Stanford University. We did do uh, 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 University of California. Golden Gate Park. Berkeley. Uh, no, it, that show was never performed outside. It was a theater show. 
it was a four wall deal. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so did you ever perform in the straight theater? No, we never performed in the straight. I'll tell you a couple of places I had to stand out where we performed. Uh, one, at one point when we were being denied access to uh, stages because of, uh, the political nature sure. and the, a lot of the language. <laughs> uh, uh, the committee uh, let us use yes. their theater over on Broadway oh. uh, for a couple of months. Uh, we played a few nights a week there. What about Dolores Park? I uh, know, but this was ne this show could not and was never. Because now they outside. perform in Golden oh, oh, Gate Park, the, the committee Dolores. Did? Oh yeah, the mind trip. Oh yeah, well, the, it, with, with the exception of the minstrel show, I believe the minstrel show was one of the earliest of the exceptions to the mind trip being uh, uh, what we call Al Fresco Theater. But the minstrel show could not be performed outside because the minstrel shows, which were the basis for the sure. original minstrel show, which sure. was the title of our show, uh, were always performed inside. They were actually early vaudeville. So right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, we having a good time. Oh yeah, we went. We left here. We left San Francisco. Uh, we the first place I recall was Denver, uh, uh, presented by uh, some young Democrats. It was a huge venue, uh, maybe fourteen, fifteen hundred people there, uh, the museum complex. That was the first thing to let us know what was going to come later on this tour for us, the Mind Troop and the Minstrels in particular. We looked up. Peter Coyote and myself and my other good friend, the three of us, uh, Peter, uh, Willie B. Hart, and myself, are on stage just ending the performance. And then Peter says to me, Jason, come over here. He says, what is that you see toward the back of the theater? And it was a huge place. And I'm squinting through the lights and I says, I don't know about you, brother, but I'm seeing police and dopamine pinchers. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and that was a sign, like I said, of how explosive that show was. They brought in more police, actually, than there were actors on the stage. That's really cool. And I won't continue to tell this story because this story has all been, already been uh, uh, recounted quite well by Peter Coyote's book. Anybody wants to read this story or any succeeding stories on the on the minstrel show, I highly recommend Peter Coyote's book, Sleeping Where I Fall. And you will find uh, uh, this guy, Jason Mark Alexander, in depth. I'd love to see in, in that book. It's documented uh, a one. photo of yourself in a minstrel show. Um, and uh, love to hold that up. Yeah, I guess you're gonna have to zoom in on this because yes. time is gonna make it real hard to recognize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we got it. Yeah, this guy right here. That's amazing. This character, About how old were you then? Uh, this picture actually is, is credited as 1965, and so that would have made me 17 at the time this picture was taken. This character is called the Stud. Ah. And at 17 years old, I'm quite proud to say that among actors who were all themselves, at least uh, in their early 20s, uh, to be 17 and sure. to be chosen to do and be the yeah. stud was an extreme, <laughs> extremely great privilege, <laughs> especially at the after party. So which one were you? Oh. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, also, uh, about how long... Uh, so this is around 65, about how long were you were with the Mind Troop? Uh, I was with them from 64 through uh, early 67. Once the Minstrel Shows uh, came to an end of this run, which was basically about two and a half years for Willie B. Hart and myself, as I mentioned, we were from the inception, including the eight to nine months of, of production that went into that show. We were the only two Actually, I'm the only one. Willie B. got sick once. I'm the only one out of well, however many hundreds of performances. I never missed a performance of that show in its entire run of wow. uh, possibly two and a half years. Wow. That's we toured the United States twice, uh, including we played. This gent was on stage at Town Hall. I want to thank you. Uh, we stayed uh, in the home of uh, Dick Gregory in that particular trip. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Did you get all the way to the East Coast? Did yeah, you make we were it? in New York City, Town Hall. Uh, 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 from, from New York City, we went up to University of Buffalo, 
and we stayed there actually a week, and we were a part of uh, 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 like a, um, like like a, a seminar, similar to a seminar. At least there was John Barth, the poet, uh, the writer, poet, uh, Robert Creeley. I met Robert Creeley and actually got uh, a book from him uh, for love. Uh, and uh, I just saw a copy at a uh, Black Oak bookstore. <laughs> uh, anyway, so like we stayed there in Buffalo for a week, and then we came back to the West Coast, uh, transiting through Canada, uh, the the uh, uh, provinces of Canada. Uh, we played in Ontario, and then uh, we flew out to uh, Western uh, Canada. We did next uh, Alberta. Uh, at the University of Canada. But how many Canada, people Canada, were you Canada. traveling? About how the many? The show total couldn't have been. There were exactly seven actors who occupied the stage. Six minstrels and one white guy in the middle. That's called, that guy's called the interlocutor. He's the guy you, you, in the circus, he'd be the circus master, and that's how he's dressed in a tuxedo and so, a white tie. Yes. Uh, uh, so seven actors on the stage, and and then we had like one guy who could do both lights and carry sure. luggage and stuff like that. Okay. So after the Mont Troupe, uh, maybe even through this time, you started doing a lot of photography? Uh, and yeah. you're still doing photography right now? Um, yeah, well, uh, photo that was a huge lapse. Uh, I just started taking photographs in um, mm, 2002. In my past, I never wanted to have photographs. You have some of them there. I'd love to see some of the ones you've done of the people and places in Golden Gate Park. All right. Let me show you something. Let me see what I've got here. I haven't seen this album in a while myself. Well, let's see. Let's, uh, these were my first serious shots. I mean... These are flowers growing in the thing. park. These are all dahlias. I spent uh, one entire season at the Dahlia Garden. It's beautiful. Uh, this particular one is one of my favorites. This one is called uh, uh, the Star. It's called the uh, the Cosmos. Beautiful. The Star Cosmos. Yeah. We've got about another minute. We could shoot some photos because okay, uh, I want to talk to you about some other things. Okay, I want to show you. But I would love to see some of this. Because you know, when you're taking your photos, you're documenting the way it is, and. Yeah. Uh, this is our neighborhood, the Haight-Ashbury, the extending Golden Gate Park. And up the hill, down the hill. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to show you a reason why uh, Birdman is called Bird. Yes. That this is one of my better birds. This is a great blue heron. All these shots are the same bird. Wow. Uh, during the same uh, spirit. This is, he's fishing and he's just here getting ready to spear that fish. Oh, that's wonderful. So you have a rapport with them. They'll come close enough to you. Yeah. You Actually, I'm about four and a half feet from this bird at this moment. He's getting ready really, to Really, really nice. Yeah. And that's something. I'm not proud of it, but I respect it and I admire it and that I realize it's some kind of, it is a special gift to Oh, be, yeah, uh, totally. Trusted by him. Yes, it is. Beautiful. So anyway, I, 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 this wonderful. is the first time I've seen this album in, in about nine so you months. Do, so I don't ever look so at So now in your stuff. life, what are you doing? Are you shooting some photography? Are you doing any writing? Uh, yeah. Uh, photography is, is what I do daily. Uh, it's actually uh, every day I take photographs. Uh, I was writing uh, when I was inside. I currently live outside by choice because yes. I've always liked nature. Sure. Uh, I'd like to uh, recite uh, a poem I wrote uh, because I had to write it. Sure. Does it and have a name? Yeah. <laughs> now they call me Birdman, but I always knew I was Icarus Blue. This poem is called, titled Icarus Blues. It's about my life as a boy. When I was a boy, I read ravenously, almost desperately, having so little I could claim as my own. In terms of history, culture, and the birthright, as you can recall, few would tell the stories of the blacks, the Hispanics, or the Indians. 
So I read the Greek tragedies, Aristophanes, Aeschylus, and Homer, desperate for some sense of myth, something holy and fantastic and enduring. I read of Icarus attempting to fly, closer to the sun than anyone had done. I can do this. So what if I die? What choice than this or to remain here on the ground? I had no legend of me on the ground. I was not told of Jesse Owens in Berlin. I didn't know that black men could fly. I remember my mother speaking of B.B. King playing in the small clubs on the Chitlin circuit in Georgia, my home, and I was ashamed. Not of my mother, but ashamed that B.B. King was not a real king. He was just a black man who could only sing the blues. Icarus was a man also but he could fly so high above the blues. Imagine the magical transition when at 18 I stood fixed on his hands, which seemed to have mastered time. Black, and he's mastered time. And my mother was right. Having not seen my mother fall, she knew. She knew of being black in the woods of Georgia and of which black men who knew it too and could sing of it and sing true. I was lucky. Before she passed away from me, I was able to tell her, Mama, I saw him. And you were right. He wasn't a king, but he did fly. I left Icarus on the shore and joined Junior Wells and Buddy Guy drinking Seagram Seven in a back room in a little club in Berkeley. Junior invited me in the room with the boys. And I took my first drink of hard liquor and was grateful. This liquor was hard. My life, like theirs, had been hard. No father, no man to tell me I was good. But here I was, lucky. And these were full-grown men loving me. And we drank hard liquor and loved the sound of men singing the blues. Buddy grinned, a huge and friendly grin that warmed me like the liquor warmed me from the and these men, not boys, embraced me. A young black man in Berkeley, California. I should know that I am free in California now, you see. And free. And these blues, my mother's blues, BB's blues, they brought me here. Icarus blues by Jason Mark Alexander. So beautiful. We want to thank you, Jason. We want to thank you for what you've done to contribute to the Bay Area, not only to the Mime Troupe in the 60s, but your spirit, your energy of love, the spirit of love, the spirit of community and freedom for yourself and those around you. 
that is something you're going to live with you and it's going to stay with you. And when people watch this tape 50 years from now, they're going to know that someone like yourself was one that was of many that contributed to a great time here that not only touched San Francisco, but the world. So thank you. My name is Rebecca Nichols. I've been your moderator. And uh, we just want to thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you.